Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Assessing CRISPR on Targeting, Editing, and Structural Changes with Udatos Using Tagify Regents. I am Antonina Salcedo of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by CQL. To learn more, please visit CQL.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. Dr. Jack T. Leonard, co-founder and chief technology officer at SQL Inc., and Dr. Georgia Giannokos, Director at Next Generation Sequencing, Editas Medicine. Jack and Georgia, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, before I hand off the presentation to Georgia, I'd like to give a brief introduction to SQL's uh, library preparation technologies. And the enzyme at the heart of SQL's library preparation biochemistry is TN5 transposase protein. Uh, TN5 transposase is particularly versatile for scaling and simplifying NGS workflows because it enables simultaneous fragmentation of the target DNA and attachment of synthetic adapters onto library fragments in a single step. We will be focused on Tagify UMI tagging reagents for the remainder of the webinar, but it's worth mentioning that our Tagify UMI tagging reagent is only one of the tools in SQL's toolbox. Tagify is the name of our adapter-loaded TN5 transposase reagents are available as standalone tagging reagents. On this slide, I have listed SQL's available Tagify reagents and SQL's library pre preparation kits um, this is not a comprehensive list of what's available, and uh, please contact us if you're interested in, uh, in Tagify loaded with custom adapters. This slide shows the general design of the Tagify UMI tagging reagents. Uh, the adapters are full length and include the P5 primer region, uh, an eight, eight base I5 barcode followed by a randomized 10 base sequence or UMI. And finally, at the three prime terminus, there is a uh, 19 base pair mosaic end sequence serves as the binding sequence for TN5 transposase. And the bottom panel on this slide shows the sequence of the adapters on the eight different Tagify UMI tagging reagents that are available uh, from SQL. And these can be dis distinguished from each other by their eight base I5 barcodes. These are uh, the same designs as described by Georgia in her Uditas publication, which is shown on the next slide. So the, the Tagify UMI tagging reagents insert semi-randomly into genomic DNA to create nested series of library fragments. Now that these Tagify UMI tagging reagents are available from SQL, we believe it will enable others to use this powerful UDITAS method that George is about to describe to you. And we encourage you to contact us if you're interested. Turn over the presentation to Georgia. Thank you, Jack. Uh, today I'll be talking about the Tagify reagents and how we use them for our UDITAS process to assess CRISPR on target editing and structural changes. First, I'll give you a quick overview of the CRISPR-Cas9 editing system. Then I'll go over our UDITAS method and how we use it to measure structural changes, specifically measuring large deletions and inversions at the CEP290 editing site. We can measure interchromosomal translocations, and we've developed accuracy standards for structural changes. And finally, I'll talk about the custom Tagify, which we use as a custom Uditas reagent in our process. And I'll show you data comparing different batches showing reproducibility. And finally, I'll talk about how we're scaling our reaction from 96 to 384 well reactions. So in the CRISPR system, 
RNAs are the targeting component of the Cas9 enzyme. As you see up here in the top right, this is a complex of the Cas9 nuclease with the guide RNA over the genomic DNA target site for cutting. And if we expand that over on the left, you'll see in the middle, that's our guide RNA, and it's, com and it's composed of two parts. What's in orange is noted as the tracer, and that part binds to the enzyme. In blue, that is the guide RNA that's designed to target the genomic DNA, as you can see on the bottom in blue. But it requires a neighboring protospace or JSON motif known as the PAM with a constant sequence that the enzyme needs to recognize and cut. Editas uses two complementary editing platforms, the Cas9 and the Cas12a. The nuclease and guide complex can precisely locate and cut genomic sites. The enzymes have the ability to target multiple sites simultaneously, and the enzymes can be engineered to reach more sites and to modulate cutting. The Cas9 recognizes purine-rich PAM, which is located three prime to the cut site. It's naturally a two-part RNA, but it can be combined into a single approximately 100 nucleotide RNA. And Cas9 results in a blunt DNA cut. Cas12a recognizes a pyrimidine-rich PAM located five prime to the cut site. It's a 40 nucleotide guide RNA. And Cas12a uh, creates a five prime staggered cut resulting in four nucleotides, uh, four to five nucleotide overhang. CRISPR-Cas9 can address a diverse uh, number of uh, mutations. You could take, in the middle, you see the enzyme complex to the guide RNA, also known as an RNP, ribonucleoprotein. And you could treat with one RNP to cut over the mutation to insert, to create a small insertion of deletion. Or you could take two RNPs and cut on either side of the mutation to delete the mutation. Both of these result in non-homologous end joining to disrupt a gene or eliminate a disease-causing mutation. On the right, you can see you could take an RNP and cut the genomic DNA, and in the presence of a double-stranded DNA, either an AEV or a plasmid, you could insert that piece of DNA into the genome using homology DNA repair, and the aim is to promote expression of correct DNA sequences. Today, what I'll focus on, and I'll show you data for, is the cut and remove approach to treat LCA10. LCA10 stands for Lieber Congenital Amaurosis Type 10. It is an autosomal recessive condition, which is a result of a biallelic loss of function um, at chromosome 12 of the CEP290 gene. And it results in severe retinal dystrophy. It is, uh, the main mutation is on intron 26, and it generates a cryptic splice donor site, IVS 26. CEP290 is present in the connecting cilium, as you can see here in the middle, between the outer and inner segment of the wild-type photoreceptors. And it's important for ciliogenesis, ciliary trafficking, and outer segment function and structure. On the right, we, ha we see what happens when um, there's mutation in CEP290, there's no cilio ciliogenesis, there's no protein trafficking, and you get degenerated discs in the outer segment of the photoreceptor. The CEP290 transcript is very large. It's 7.5 kb, and it's too large to package in an AV for traditional AV uh, gene therapy. So we're using gene editing to repair CEP290 splicing defect. As you can see here, as I mentioned, IVS26 is a point mutation which results in a cryptic splice donor site between exon 26 and 27. So in the presence of the mutation during transcription, you have a 128 base pair fragment of the intron that gets inserted between exon 26 and 27, which results in a premature stop codon and a truncated non-functional protein. We're using uh, edit 101 to correct this mutation. 
Edit 101 is an AV that expresses two guides, Guide 323 and Guide 64, in addition to the Staph aureus Cas9 enzyme. And it will either cut and delete the mutation or invert that segment. And that will result in the correct splicing and a correct full-length functional CEP290 protein. Now, there are challenges with, the, with PCR NGS assays when making multiple edits. As I mentioned before, there are two cuts at the CEP290 uh, mutation site, and they're 1.1 kb apart. So if you want to set up PCR assays, you'll need to set up at least three amplicons, one targeting each of the cut sites, and then another one for the productive deletion. And if you want to look at the productive inversion, then you need two additional amplicons. So even with rigorous standards, it's difficult to cross compare assays. With DDPCR, you can sufficiently measure the deletion. As you see here, there is a probe set in the middle of the 1.1 kb region that is uh, deleted upon editing, and it's a loss of signal assay. However, if you have an inversion, you won't be able to distinguish it from the wild type locus. So what we've done is we've uh, developed this unidirectional targeted sequencing assay, which we call UDITAS, and it's an NGS method for measuring all edited junctions, including the indels. As you can see here, we have a custom uh, transposome, which is made up of a TN5 enzyme and an Illumina adapter that has a unique molecular identifier barcode to count uh, editing events. Uh, the uh, pooling barcode uh, to pool a lot of different samples and the common P5 adapter sequence where you could do the universal amplification. And the way this works is you take this custom transposome and you combine it with genomic DNA extracted from edited cells and it will fragment approximately 2KB pieces and tag on the adapter. And then in order to enrich these uh, edited fragments, you design a sequence-specific primer upstream or downstream of the target site, and you amplify with the common uh, P5 uh, primer. In round two, then you use the uh, round two P7 primer, which adds another barcode onto the library. Now you have a full length sequencing library that you can load onto the Illumina sequencer. So here are the editing events that we could detect uh, with the UDITAS. And here, if we use one UDITAS primer, we could look at small indels, uh, looking at guide three, from the guide 323 site. If you have a large deletion of the 1.2 KB fragment, you'll create a new junction and you'll be able to detect that. If the 1.2 KB um, fragment gets removed, inverted, and goes back into the cut site, it'll create another new junction. And again, we'll be able to identify that new junction. In addition, we'll be able to read the UMIs to count the number of edited events. So we tested the UDIT, we did a proof of concept experiment uh, with UDITAS using U2OS cells nuclear affected with plasmids expressing the Staph aureus Cas9 and the two guides, 64 and 323. And we were able to see a wide range of edits, as you can see here, uh, the small indels in green and the desired large deletion and inversion in uh, orange and blue, which make up about 60% of the edits. In addition, a very small amount of homologous sequence, which is the fusion of the, chromosome, the, chrom the sister chromosomes that have been edited. In addition, a very small amount of plasmid insertion. Next, we wanted to see uh, what was the limit of detection of our UDITAS assay to detect these desired large deletions and inversions. So we took genomic DNA from an edited uh, stable HEC293 cell line, which had the deletion and inversion. And we mixed it with uh, genomic DNA from the parental HEC293 cells at various ratios. And you could see here a very nice linear 
um, detection all the way down to about 1.1%. And then we also applied UDITAS to uh, hundreds of samples from a mouse pharmacology experiment. We had a humanized CEP290 knock-in mouse model, and we treated that, the mice with uh, EDIT101, which is an AV5, as you can see here. Uh, and it, it consists of the two guides, 323 and 64, and also uh, a Staph aureus a Cas9. The guides are driven by a U6 promoter, and the, and the enzyme is the, the GRK1 promoter. The AAB was subretinally injected into the eyes of the mice. And what you can see here is you have a very nice correlation. As the Cas9 mRNA increases, you get an increase in total editing rates uh, using with UDITAS. We were able to do CEP290 editing in human retinal explants that were treated with EDIT101. We did this study with Lion's Eye Institute in Florida. Uh, they were able to obtain humanized three to five hours post-mortem. They were able to remove the retina, create three millimeter punches, and take those punches with the photoreceptors facing down into the plate, into 24 well plate and then transduced the retina with the NAAB. And after four weeks, they were able to collect the genomic DNA and we were able to process it with UDITAS to look at the editing. And what you see here below is that uh, treated uh, retinal punches with uh, EDIT101, 5E to the 11 viral genomes, gave you about approximately 40% editing and about 15% were um, functional edits, the inversions, and the deletions. UDITAS can also measure interchromosomal translocations. What we have here is an experiment where CD4 positive human primary T cells were nucleo affected with two RNPs. One RNP had a guide to track to the track locus on chromosome four. The, R the other RNP had a guide to the B2M locus on chromosome 15. And what we have here, this red line re represents the editing event, and the arrows represent the two UDITAS primers that we use to measure these events. There are 10 possible outcomes, as you can see here in the middle under the schematic. And uh, first we have uh, the top in the blue, the events for the track locus. You have the unedited, and below that, the edited. And then the dicentric and acentric translocations, which result from edits and fusion of the sister chromosomes. Below that in green are the same events that you see at the B2M locus. And below that, are the translocations between the track and the B2M chromosomes, both the balanced allele and the acentric and the dicentric translocations. Seven of these events are measurable by the two primers, primer one and primer two. And as you can see here, when you ha we had very high editing, 82 to 91% for track and B2M respectively. And we also were able to detect with that high editing about two to 2.6% balanced trans translocations. We're we were also able to create a series of six plasmid standards uh, for the track B2M translocation. And we added SNPs at every 10 bases, so we were able to differentiate between the plasmids. We then diluted these plasmids and serially uh, titrated them from 1.5 to million molecules down to 3,000 molecules and spiked them into mouse genomic DNA. And we wanted to determine the sensitivity and the specificity, and we ran it through UDITAS and the anchored multiplex PCR. Uh, anchored multiplex PCR was developed in uh, John Eofrate's lab at Mass General. And basically, it's similar to UDITAS, but it has additional steps, including fragmentation and adapter ligation. And we wanted to compare the two methods. What you see here on the right is the, the UDITAS shows really high accuracy and linearity. We also see good linearity with the AMP-seq. However, it is a little bit less accurate and it's 
probably due to the additional steps of fragmentation, adaptive ligation, and cleanup. We process thousands of samples uh, with UDITAS every year at EDITAS for all our different programs. And it's very difficult getting a batch of reagents uh, that are consistent uh, across batches uh, and give us reproducible results. So we reached out to SQL for their help. The first proof of concept experiment was with the SQL enzyme uh, in the storage buffer. And we did multiple dilutions to see which one worked the best. Here, what I'm showing you is a, a profile of the, the fragmented um, DNA using the different dilutions of the enzyme uh, and comparing it with our protocol. We took the best dilutions and we made Uditas uh, libraries and we sequenced them. And what you see here is that the SQL uh, 1 to 2 dilution enzyme uh, performed the best. We had the similar recounts. The median size libraries were, were the same. And we had greater than 85% of the reads uh, lining to the target. We were able to see very good reproducibility across batches. Uh, here is an example where we had eight samples that were edited with an AV that expressed two guides in the Cas12A enzyme. Uh, and the goal was to excise a 2.2 kb region. And what you see here on the left with the batch that we had obtained last year, we got really nice editing uh, up to 100%. And you could see all the different types of edit, including the productive edits, which are the larger inversions and deletions. We saw some AV uh, integration, the small indels. And one thing I want to point out in pink are the large resections, which are uh, approximately 50 bases or larger, uh, and in addition to translocations. And there is very good consistency across batches. Uh, the results look almost identical. Next, we wanted to try scaling from 96 well reactions to 384 well. And here we have a triplicate reactions in 96 wells and 384 wells. We took an IPSC clone that had been edited at two target sites, and we used two Uditas primers to look at the results. You see really nice recounts. Uh, the median size, fragment size was the same, around 325. We saw greater than 95% of the reads mapping to the target region. And we saw greater than 7,000 unique edited events. And what's clear is that the 384 well reaction captured more unique edited events, and the results are reproducible. When we looked at these edited events closely, we were able to identify there were two types of events in, e, in uh, using each primer. On the left is the primer for gene target one. We see the two events. Uh, the small indels and an inversion. And uh, on the right, you see the, again, the two events that were from gene two, again, small indels and the inversion. So our primers can detect in this clone uh, that there is a large inversion that has occurred between the two genes. So in summary, Uditas can be used to detect all on-target editing events indels, large deletions, inversions, resections, and interchromosomal translocations. We've used the SQL custom tagify reagent for the Uditas process. We provided SQL with four adapters. These were complex Illumina P5 barcoded, barcoded um, UMI oligos uh, that were annealed, the top and bottom uh, strands, and SQL complexed these adapters with their enzyme and returned ready-to-use reagents. The batches are consistent, and they provide similar tagmentation profiles and editing results. The reactions can be scaled from 96 to 384 wells, and we've been able to process thousands of reactions over one year. I would like to acknowledge the, the Editas team, um, my team in, in particular, John Shula, Lily Maxim, and two previous team members, Emily Brennan and Tyrone Tamaklo. 
Also, I want to thank uh, Eugenio Marco, who heads our computational biology, Chris Wilson, who heads uh, lead discovery, and our CSO, Mark Sherman. And I would also like to thank the SQL team, specifically Jack Leonard, and also Ariel Hammock. So thank you. Um, open for any questions. Thank you, Jack, Georgia, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question here is, how does UDITAS differ from Guide Set? Um, GuideSeq is a, um, a discovery assay. It's a cellular discovery assay of potential off targets. Um, what usually happens is during a, a transfection, not only is an RNP, but a double-stranded short oligo is introduced into the cells. Once editing occurs, the double-stranded oligo gets inserted into the cut site by non-homologous end joining, and that tags the potential off target. Uh, you could use UDITAS uh, to perform the guide seek reaction, and that's what we do here at Editas. What we do is design two primers uh, targeting the double stranded oligo. One primer targets the top strand, the other primer targets the bottom strand. And you can look and see where the double stranded oligo inserts on both sides of the, of the cut. Um, and um, Yes, you could collect those off targets and then you can uh, verify them either with uh, UDITAS or another uh, method. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question here, can you use these Tagify regions for off target QC? Um, so you can, you can definitely design uh, UDITAS primers to look at potential off targets. You have to know what the, what the target site would be. Um, and you would design a primer, and not only would you be able to identify the uh, indel, but you would also be able to identify a potential translocation. Uh, we've used, um, with the UDITAS, uh, we showed in the data today that uh, we could identify potential translocations, and in some cases we actually looked at the data more closely. Uh, in most of the cases, the translocations are um, random events due to DNA breaks. However, there are some cases where these are um, recurring events, and we have been able to identify a translocation with an off-target, and we've been able to verify that by going to the off-target location and designing Uditas primers from there. Um, so it can be used to, to assess off targets. Yes. Thank you. Our next question, how many samples can be prepared in a single batch? So we could run 96 samples on a plate, uh, and we could run two plates, uh, in one day. Uh, so in total, we could prepare 192 samples. Uh, we could do more than that. Uh, we have four Tagify reagents with four uh, P5 adapters, but we normally run two. Um, and we put those together into a single uh, MySeq run to buy 350 base pairs. Great, thank you. Another question, how many reads do you target per sample? So we put 50 nanograms of genomic DNA into the reaction, and that's about 14,000 uh, genomic uh, target sites. Um, so when we uh, process the, the two batches of samples, 192 samples, that comes out to about um, 50 to 100,000 reads. And on average, we get about um, 10,000 unique uh, events during, for each sample. Thank you. Another question, how do you minimize the level of background reads from PCR artifacts? And what is that the level that you typically see? 
Well, when we design uh, primers, we usually design three primers per target site, and they're uh, roughly 30 MERS. And we test them to, we put them through the UDITAS process. So we make UDITAS libraries uh, with unedited genomic DNA, and we sequence it, and then we map the reads, and we choose the best performing primer that give, gives us greater than 85% of the reads mapping to the target site. Um, we also size select the libraries before we sequence them uh, between 400 to about 850 base pairs, and that eliminates a lot of the smaller PCR primers, uh, adaptive dimer uh, primer products. Um, so we don't see many artifacts as a result of the size selection as well. Great, thank you. I have some good questions coming in here. Um, someone is asking, are there certain gene editing sequences or therapies that are particularly useful, useful for the UDITAS method versus, say, PCR? So it's, um, with UDITAS, I think what, what is uh, really nice is the fact that you can look and see if you have any type of translocations, uh, especially if you're doing multi-gene editing. Uh, you can't do that with PCR. PCR, you have to anchor a region with two primers. Great, thank you. Um, another question, what are the current limitations of this assessment? The limitations, it depends on what the, the you know, the, the level of the editing is. Um, we have been able, as you saw with the data, to uh, identify uh, potential uh, translocations with, uh, you know, down to a frequency of close to 0.1%, which is the sensitivity of the uh, uh, NGS platform as well. Thank you. Um, and we'll wrap with this last question. Um, you kind of touched on it already, but could you please describe the main advantages of UDITAS over other methods? Well, UDITAS, it's a, it's a very um, simple assay with relatively low input, 50 nanograms, uh, and you could get a lot of information from a single reaction. Um, as we showed today, uh, you could assess uh, small indels, large deletions, inversions, translocations. And the other nice thing is that you could, it's very scalable and you could process a lot of samples at once. Thank you so much. Thank you both Jack and Georgia for your informative presentations um, and your important research. We'd like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor Sequel for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labrys will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with any one of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone, goodbye.